Welcome to Wine Soundtrack South Africa. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities and passions. Hello friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Marina Kahlo and today I'm sitting with Skalk Opperman, who is the winemaker of Coin Rock Winery. Skalk, a very warm welcome. Can you please tell me a little bit more about yourself? Yes, Marina, thank you very much for having me. I'll uh, do my very best in my second language, and that is English, to, to uh, put up a good performance for you today. Um, yeah, so like you said, my name is Skalk Opperman. Um, I'm currently a winemaker at uh, Coin Rock Wines in the Stellenbosch Valley, right up to the Simonsburg area. And uh, yeah, um, in terms of my winemaking career, it's, it was born out of the, the Stellenbosch Valley. Uh, where I started working for, for some wineries in this area and I have a combined experience of about uh, seven to, to nine years in the Stellenbosch area. Overall about 16 years in the wine industry and I must say we just uh, spoke about it before uh, this, this chat um, about what a lacquer place Stellenbosch is uh, to have you here on the ground, uh, the wines we get to make here, the vineyards we get to work with and you know being amongst the people of the wine industry and you know, um, have you ear on the ground always about what's happening and what's a buzz and stuff happening in the industry. And um, I, for one, I'm a winemaker. I'd like to experiment and you know, challenge myself. And I fi- find Stellenbosch, an uh, area where you can live that out. And I, I really enjoy that uh, that part of being here. So my focus have always been uh, quality wine production um, on a premium and ultra premium end of, of, of things. Uh, that's what I firmly believe South Africa can do. I believe that we are able to offer quality that uh, is exceptional and in terms of a value point of view some of the best in the world and um, I aim to to exhibit that in my wine that I see as a as an art form uh, that I enjoy every day. I must agree with you. Um, the energy here in Stellenbosch is really something something quite unique. Whether whether it is the students or the wineries or just I, I don't know. It certainly has a, a very special and unique energy in this area. So at Coin Rock, how many hectares of land are you farming at the moment under vine? Yes, uh, so Quen Rock is about uh, 200 hectares big in terms of the whole farm, um, of which about 45 hectares are vineyards. 10 hectares of those are quite recently planted in the last uh, three years. So there's constant uh, redevelopment as well in terms of uh, vineyards, which is always good to see in the farm that the, that the extra effort is being put into um, in a renewal of its of its product. Um, along with that, we've got some cattle farming, we've got some Wagyu uh, beef that we're farming, uh, new uh, plantings of uh, almonds, uh, nuts, uh, some olives, so quite diverse. Um, and then, uh, of course, along with all of that is the, the venues and hospitality side, the restaurant, uh, Gata restaurant, which is exceptional, beautiful, fine dining, and then uh, obviously the weddings and functions as well that we do. It really is an, a very impressive building that uh, if, you, if you're driving up to Coin Rock, it certainly uh, makes quite a strong impression. And uh, Gate, I haven't eaten there myself, but I've heard amazing things, some real high-end fine dining food. So uh, definitely one to look out for, for our listeners if they ever find themselves in Stellenbosch. Tell me, how many cases of wine do you roughly produce every year? Yes, yeah, so we produce about 100,000 bottles a year on the Quin Rock Ranges. Um, so again, the focus is there on quality rather than, than volume. We can certainly do a lot more. Uh, we at this stage sell off quite a bit of our grapes and some of our bulk wines uh, that we don't get to use in, a, in, in our own wines to the rest of the industry. And uh, the, the challenge is to grow the brand uh, in terms of volume as well, um, but maintaining the, the quality always. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's quite a privilege. I, I get to play uh, with quite a vast amount of vineyards and different blocks of cab, for instance, and get to select from that to only produce the best that we can from from our vineyards. You mentioned Cabernet. Um, tell me a bit more about your range. What what will we find in that? Yeah, so I think uh, if you think of Simonsburg, you always think of Cabernet. Um, it is one of the varietals that does the best there. But um, And therefore also our flagship wine is our Bordeaux Red Blend, uh, which is all five Bordeaux varietals. Uh, it's all, obviously everything planted there on the farm. We have a Shiraz as well, beautiful, dark, structured, um, uh, grippy Shiraz. Um, 
which really reacts well to the soil and the terroir there. It's one of our highest vineyards as well. So you get a bit of that cool sea breezes. It makes it quite a special Shiraz. Although for me, it's always a bit more of a cab country. Um, and then on the white side of things, uh, what we try and focus on is definitely our Chardonnay. It's been doing really well. It's also a beautiful block. Um, uh, Nico Walters, that's our farm manager, uh, um, really did a good job in planting that. Um, you know, um, he's got a lot of new pruning techniques uh, under the Guyot system and uh, and so forth that, that helped a lot in terms of the production and the quality production of, on the Chardonnay. And then uh, we also have some Souvenir Blanc, of course. Um, one of our, our wines that we do is the Quinrock White. Uh, which is mainly Sauvignon Blanc, but also a bit of Semillon. Now, the Semillon is not from the Quenrock farm. It's from our Nave estate in the Elam area uh, called Boskloof. It's also our farm. Uh, and that's a 3,000 hectare farm. Um, luckily, not all under vine, otherwise I would have been a very busy man. Uh, but we only have about 20, 25 hectares of vineyards there. And that's where the Semillon is from, going in debt. And then also the, the, the main component on that farm is our Chardonnay, uh, which mainly goes to our MCC production, which is also one of our core products. So that's pretty much it, uh, Black Series MCC, um, that we also do proper aging on the lease, four years minimum, up to six years and some of the vintages before we disgorge. So uh, again, there, like with our other wines, like I mentioned earlier before, uh, we're really pushing the limits in terms of quality. Uh, we believe we can make uh, uh, MCC as good as any champagne out there and we back ourselves for that so. and Cap Classique is such a strong category for us at the moment so uh, definitely worth the push and I, what I do like is that it's a, a very very small but very focused range of wines you're not stretching yourself into to a whole bunch of secondary labels and, and making a whole range of wines that really stretch beyond and then you kind of lose focus so mm. I quite like that personally um, outside of the South African borders, where do you export your wines to? Where can our listeners potentially pick up some of Coin Rock's wines? Yeah, so we're currently working um, quite hard on uh, expanding our export footprint. Obviously, with COVID and stuff, it was quite difficult to get out there. But uh, currently, we are available in, uh, in the U.S., uh, we've got some Chinese um, uh, importers as well, uh, Germany, Netherlands, uh, Switzerland. Um, I hope I didn't forget anybody, but that's, uh, that's about it. Um, we also have a strong focus on our local market, um, especially up north in, in the Joburg, uh, Gauteng area, where I think we have quite a strong footprint. And so we see the value in both. Uh, you, you know, COVID also taught us that, you know, when we had this, this brief period where we couldn't export uh, the local market, it was it was very handy also to have so uh, I, lo I love the balance that we are maintaining there in terms of local versus export yeah certainly um, quite a few markets there that that our listeners can catch your wines in um, over to you Skulk do you recall like a seminal moment when you drank wine and thought wow this is quite something yeah, I wouldn't say it's a, a one specific moment for me. It was more sort of a lifestyle that I developed. I grew up with my, my, my parents always loving wine and good food. And so there was always wine uh, with some food around the table. And it's all experience of the food and wine. You know, everybody's talking about food and wine experience. But for me, it's such a beautiful thing. And that's what really got me hooked on it, that one can enjoy a glass of wine with food and the one makes the other better. It's not that the wine should be the star or the food should be the star. It's that moment where you taste the wine with the food and go, okay, I get it. And um, there was be, there's been quite a few such moments. So to pick out the wine would be quite difficult. So well, That's fair enough. I think I can appreciate that very much. Um, speaking of wine and food, mm. um, if you were to pair white wine uh, or red wine with specific dishes, mm. is there a recipe for you in terms of pairing and how it works or is it more a case of trial and error and having a bit of fun? 
Yeah, um, I've been lucky throughout all the wineries I've been working and in, including uh, Gata at the moment as well, where I always had a very close relationship with the chefs themselves. So I would invite them to taste my wines during, during my blending trials when we build up the wine. And likewise, when they build up the new menus, um, I get to sit with them and see about the flavors. And I've always loved that, um, you know, winemaker dinners uh, that we presented sort of on a monthly basis uh, to sit with the chef and say, okay, oh, this worked, this doesn't work, a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that. And um, so that's something I quite quite enjoy. It's, uh, well, I hope it answers your question. It definitely does. Now, Skalk, I know you've traveled fairly extensively abroad. Are there any standout international wines that you've enjoyed uh, on your travels or even back home here in South Africa that really stood out for you? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, again, uh, there's been many, it's like the moments you, you spoke about in terms of wine. Um, if I can go brand wise, I had a, a privilege of having a Chateau Magdalene 1964. Uh, back in Bordeaux, I was lucky that uh, one of my battle suppliers wanted to open that bottle on the night. And uh, um, the farm doesn't exist anymore. I think it's now Chateau Del Air or something like that in Sinti Milan. That was exceptional. Um, I appreciated the fact that, that how the wine could age. That somebody in '64 thought it, of putting the wine to bottle and put a cork into it, and I got to drink it so many years later, and it was still so fresh and beautiful. Um, the other one was a 1981 Opus One from uh, Robin Davi, which I expected a little bit more big and structured, and with, um, you know, the first thing come to mind a lot of new oak. Obviously, in those days, I'm not sure what the recipe was, but it worked well. The wine was still fresh beautiful and that was one of my wine moments I could say and then yeah that's uh, that's basically my my two international ones and then obviously back in the day um, where I started my career the Risse Freire uh, side of things um, I got to taste there many wines that still today um, brings back really good memories so yeah. it's amazing when you think of that 1964 wine um, the person who probably made that wine could be dead by now you most know likely. most likely <laughs> um, so it's really is almost a legacy yeah. piece yeah. in so many ways which of the coin rock wines is the most expensive tell me a, more, a bit more about that and what does it cost yeah so actually the wines i've mentioned up to now is our core products um, and i like you said i love the fact that we're focusing on that saying that's what we do best and what do we want to do. Um, the most expensive of them would be our uh, Quinrock Red Blend. It's about 750 Rand a bottle on a retail uh, price. Uh, again, we back ourselves in terms of the quality and um, you know, also with an international focus um, on that price point that we do believe it's still it's a good offer at the quality that we can offer and we can ask that um, if you look at the, the effort we put in vineyards and cellar to really put to bottle and also age the bottle at our storage facilities before releasing so we're currently in our 2016 vintage so you know it's testament to the fact that we age it until we think it's perfect for 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 release and then release it's not one of those situations where you buy it and you know uh, you decide we want you to drink it at the best time um, so that's uh, probably in that range but we do have sort of um, side uh, line little special stuff that we come across every now and then um, the boss likes to call it sort of the ghost range um, um, projects where we for instance like last year we found the semilon from a Bosch Club farm two or three barrels it was just incredible and uh, we decided to bottle that on its own uh, price to be determined but it won't be cheap um, same with a cab frank uh, that we're doing a, a red icon uh, on an icon label uh, which will be closer to three three and a half thousand and a bottle um, vitali gaiduk the owner of the farm uh, he is a passionate wine drinker and a lover of wine and the art of wine and one of his favorite areas is Amaroni and Amaroni style wines. So we're also producing a style of wine like that uh, yet to be released. It will be a Solera kind of blend over four or five vintages. Incredible interesting wine and we actually 
managed to get it quite close to the to the real Amaroni real deal. And um, there again, it's a sort of a wine club uh, membership uh, release that we're doing. And uh, those are super expensive wines. But then again, like I said, uh, we back ourselves, and it is limited qu- uh, quality uh, quantity. So yeah. They certainly sound very, very interesting, especially that uh, Amarona style um, Solera. Okay, do you believe in the perfect variety? Does that exist? Yeah, sure. Perfect variety per soil type or per terroir, what works for you. Um, so for me, the perfect variety on our Simonsburg slopes is cab. And you see, we've seen it across all um, areas on the farm, across all soil types and uh, across all clones. So it seems to be something that's really happy there. So to select one single uh, varietal, like my previous uh, work was back in the Swartland as well. I mean, over there, Shiraz, you think of Grenache, that kind of stuff, it works there. Um, it speaks of the area, the area suited to it. Um, but that stuff doesn't necessarily work that well on our side. So, yeah, horses for courses, I, I'd say. Yeah, I think it's a, a very, very valid uh, point of view for sure. What is your opinion on competitions, wine critics, and scoring? Ooh, you brought that up. <laughs> that's a surprise. That's a surprise question. <laughs> um, I think there's some value to it in terms of uh, retail space. Um, if you like it or you don't like it, like me, uh, people do buy with their eyes. Uh, so first of all, we work hard on having a pretty label. Uh, you know what it costs to design a label. It's, uh, I think a lot of our consumers have uh, our table will fall on the back of the year what it costs to develop a label. So it's always been strange to me, sort of, you're developing the perfect label and you stick a lot of other random stickers over it. Uh, but on the other side, the consumer wants a reference. There's certain references they trust, or whatever the competition may be. And if you like it or, or not, it doesn't matter. It's about... At the end of the day, we back the quality we sell, but you still need the consumer to buy it. And sometimes the consumer, if you can't, aren't able to reach them, like we'd like to do in terms of a hand sell, in terms of our products, uh, they need a bit of a reference and then it's extremely valuable. Um, I think each producer also needs to take um, a lot of effort and time, like we do, to decide what uh, competitions is important, uh, what works for your brand. Um, look at the panels, what what kind of wines do they like. Um, and uh, therefore also do a bit of homework before before you do that. So, But again, like I said, I'm building my career on, uh, on premium wine styles and uh, anything that we put out there and put our names on, we, we back it 100% ourselves. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think there's a, a time and a place for competitions and critics, but very much agree with you. You need to be selective and 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 do what's right for your brand. So it is very, it can be a minefield out there with with so many to choose from. As a consumer, Skulk, do you have a preference for red, white, rosé, bubbly? What what do you generally turn to? I'm definitely more on the red side of things. I do like my structured reds. I would uh, enjoy maybe getting home, have a glass of white, uh, or maybe a glass of bubbly, but then move on very quickly onto the reds. Uh, It's just for me in terms of, I think a lot of the time, I think from a wine making point of things, when I drink wine, you can't help yourself. So also also super critical, which can be very irritating (laughs) for yourself. but I like the the depth of the red wine and so much going on there that you can you can question a lot about it. You know what kind of oak was used, how many days aging, uh, was it aged too long, too short? Um, you know, I, I like that part of of the red wine. So you've been at home, you've had a little gathering of friends, had that starter bubbly, and moved on to the reds, and the reds were flowing all night. Yeah. What is your perfect hangover cure? Mm. Is there such a thing? Yes, for sure. It's called a steady stumpy, a chocolate <laughs> steady stumpy. <laughs> um, but you know what I've noticed uh, over the years? I'm, I'm not a young man anymore. 
and it just becomes harder. So unfortunately, there's no good news out there. There's no quick fix. <laughs> it only gets worse. <laughs> I love your answers. So for our listeners abroad, Steri Stumpy is basically chocolate-flavored milk, or well, different flavored milk, but in a in a small um, 350 ml, and we get them in in lots of different flavors here in South Africa. Um, and yes. It does work. It no, definitely absolutely. does yeah, work. Sure. It's um, <laughs> I tried and tested by uh, my, my very self. <laughs> so, um, space aliens, a UFO lands on that beautiful patch of grass outside the Coin Rock building. Mm-hmm. And um, they're here to explore Earth, but they're thirsty. Mm-hmm. What do you give them to drink? Ooh, space aliens. So, you want to sort of in one drink show whatever you need to show over there well they're going to be thirsty so you're not immediately going for a red um i would definitely think in terms of a bubbly makes everybody happy it's fresh it's welcoming mm-hmm. and i think it explains a lot about our philosophy uh, again that grapes coming from our, our ilum farm the chardonnay but also some chardonnay that's coming from a stellenbosch farm so it's a perfect blend between the two worlds and i think uh Everybody and hopefully aliens as well appreciate a good glass of bubbles. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they definitely will enjoy that very much. Do you have any good luck rituals um, or, or anything like that? Any special kind of rabbit's tail that you hold on to as harvest is about to start or during harvest? No, sure. I think it's all about a good vibe. So, we're really concentrating in the cellar to we work or asses off if I may say that uh, but it's always about also having fun while you do it because um, like we're usually a small team seven or eight people uh, some international help as well and um, the idea is to like you spend four months together 24 7 almost you just go to sleep at home and then you come back so I think it's quite pivotal that you keep a good uh, sense of humor um, that you're accurate in your work for sure uh, but that you have fun in between and that you learn and you listen to one another and that's what we try and achieve over at Quain Rock and uh, it's, so far it's been working well for us um, other than that, uh, music we play a lot of music, we've got loudspeakers all the time and believe in the good vibes that that creates, so yeah <laughs> So music can create good vibes, certainly amongst the workers. Do you think that music in your vineyards or in your cellar or even uh, uh, it's been noted that many winemakers talk to their vines or talk to the wines in the barrel when it's quieter in the cellar. Do you, do you believe in any of that? Do you do any of that? Yeah, I wouldn't say I believe in, in, in uh, as a religion, <laughs> but um, I think it's important for you as an artist to spend some time with your with your stuff, your battles, with your wine, with your juice, uh, in the vineyard, with the vineyards, uh, that, you, that you get it. It's sort of that marriage happen. And uh, that I believe firmly in, uh, that you truly understand what you're working with. So, and that I do religiously, I go out in the vineyard on my own some days, um, a lot of the time with the viticulturist, Nico Walters, or with my uh, assistant, Peter. Um, whoever and I enjoy sharing and talking about it but sometimes you need to go out there alone and just go walk through it and feel it and get a get an understanding of where you are are you happy with the call you're making now should you wait a bit more should you get some extra help in <laughs> or not um, yeah so that's yeah I can imagine that just some quiet time to just engage and and really feel what nature around you is trying to tell you. I think there's definitely value in that for sure. What did you want to be when you were a little boy? (laughs) A game ranger, actually. (laughs) I always loved animals and the Kruger National Park and all that kind of area. So that was for me the ultimate job. Um, Other than that, probably any other boy's dream is to be a policeman or army man or, you know, uh, all that that stuff. But uh, obviously that uh, vanished quickly as you grow up. And at the end of the day, I got to work with nature, what I'm doing today, so, which is a part of my everyday work. That's why I enjoy it so much. I'm in the middle of Stellenbosch. There's places on Coin Rock where I've got no cell phone signal, so love it. <laughs> no, that is, it really is the best of both worlds yeah. in so many ways, for sure. Tell me, when you're not working, what do you do in your free time? 
I relax at home, have a braai, have quite many, many braais, spend some time with family and friends. Um, I've recently had a newborn little daughter called Sadie, she's 11 months old today, or oh, actually last week, sorry, almost here, uh, so that takes up a lot of my, <laughs> my time these days. Other than that, I plan trips with the family or friends, which usually uh, is out to nature, some national park or something, or I'm, a, I'm an avid hunter as well, like many winemakers are in South Africa uh, and through that I've, uh, I've uh, learned a lot of respect for, for nature and a lot of my planning my time goes into planning that so try and do four or five trips like that a year so um, if harvest is done I usually am out in the field somewhere walking in the bush and uh, or in a trade one of those three <laughs> <laughs> one of those three and hopefully if you're in the bush or having one of those brides or trips with friends there's lots of those ch- chocolate dairy stumpies hidden yeah. away for the next day <laughs> um, are you into sports at all are there any teams that you support or players or anything like that Absolutely, I'm a fanatic. I love my sport, any kind of sport actually. Um, mainly, obviously, rugby, being South African, so that's quite obviously the spring box. And uh, Western Province isn't doing too badly lately, or should I say the Stormers, uh, which is my, my local team over here. Cricket, IPL, IPL cricket, it's always fun. I uh, enjoy the hype around that, and uh, um, obviously, there's a lot of money being thrown into that, so it becomes a bit more spectator thing, which is nice. It's, it's after this two years we've been through it's so nice to see full stadiums and stuff like that happening and then yeah many other stuff golf whatever it may be wherever there's a challenge and you can have a bit of a bet amongst your friends uh, on it and uh, a team to be proud of I guess that's what it's about so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think sport is supposed to be something that's fun, that's, that, that takes your mind off things. And if you want to have a bit of additional fun with some side bets, it yeah. always just adds to it, especially yeah. if you're a group of friends and you can take the take it to another level for sure. Are you into music? Any genres, any bands, any artists that you particularly like? Yes, I hope you have a lot of South African listeners because I'm, I'm uh, very much into my Saki Saki. And, uh, <laughs> so your local Afrikaans music is a big love of, of mine, but in terms of genres, I enjoy anything really out there. It depends on the mood. It's again like your wine. and uh, It depends on the mood. Um, I love country music, obviously being a burki. Uh, and yeah, that's that's about it. So yeah. And movies? Do you enjoy movies? Are there any movies that are like mm. ones that you can just always watch over and over, and it just always invokes certain feelings? Yeah, there's one that springs to mind is The Ghost in the Darkness by Val Kilmer. He's one of the actors in there about this two lions uh, that were attacking these guys, uh, building a railway up there in uh, Mombasa area. And uh, I've read a book, I've watched a movie probably countless times and that that wakes up that childhood dreams I had as a boy, you know, the whole game and age part of things. So that uh, adventure and excitement that goes with it um, is always fun. But I think these days there's so little times that people get excited about movies anymore because we've got all these things these days Netflix and Showmax or whatever is out there so you're almost more into serious these days which is kind of sad because it was always nice you know um, building up that hype about a new James Bond movie coming out Uh, but these days I find myself uh, watching a lot of documentary style uh, stuff uh, which I like because it's a bit of education side of it as well so Mm. Yeah, I think uh, certainly I was actually chatting over the weekend to someone and saying how, you know, movies might even become obsolete in time because Mm -hmm. all these series that you can watch on demand um, are kind of really building deeper characters with mm. with so much more complexity and, and you can go in so much further than just a two or two or three hour long movie. Exactly. Uh, what advice would you give someone? Just general advice on life. What do you think is the best piece of advice you can impart? Hmm. Okay. One of them would be not to take yourself too serious. Um, to have some time to, to have fun. I think I mentioned it earlier in terms of a harvest approach. Um, although that my, myself and my team are very serious about what we do, what we do in terms of quality point of level, getting uh, efficient work done. 
I think it's sometimes good to sit back and be able to laugh at the mistakes that you make, to understand that a mistake is a mistake, and that as, as long as you act and don't do it again, it remains a mistake and not the other word. <laughs> and um, yeah, read. Um, you know, continue to try and develop yourself uh, in terms of business, but out of your field as well. I'm a winemaker, but I take a lot of time and effort to teach myself about business side of things, uh, the marketing side of things. Um, don't get tunnel vision. Have a broad uh, view in terms of if it's your industry or the kind of life you want to live, but have a bit of a broader view than just what you see in front of you. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's really good advice, I must say, um, especially the reading for me. I think, you know, you just need to always try and develop yourself further. You can't stop learning because then you, you're going to stop living in so many ways. Uh, what would you say is your proudest professional achievement? Mm, okay, yes, there's again a, quite a few that springs to mind. Um, I think if I look at my career... Um, and it's, <laughs> I hope it doesn't sound arrogant, but I've always been involved in brands up to before Queen Rock, obviously, which is a very well established brand. Um, it's got its markets. There's a definite style of wine. Vineyards have been well established. Uh, it's a good product to work from point one the day that I stepped into the cellar. But prior to that, I've always been involved in sellers that were either in a process or needed to be. Um, let's not say revamped, but restructured, um, whole new business model, new ranges of wines. Um, and that was just in plain words, been in trouble and needed a bit of a lift. And if I look at each of them, they are better off today. I'm proud of what we did there. And um, it formed part of my career unintentionally, but it really awakened something in me that I really thoroughly enjoy apart from just my winemaking is also being very involved in the business side of things and that business side of things gets me to work with people a lot more being in the market a lot more and that I enjoyed a lot and I'm very proud of the contacts that I made and the friendships I, I grew over the years and therefore, you know, at this stage I've got a lot of more value to add to the wine industry than what I would have if I was just focusing on wine. Mm. Yeah, I think, you know, you need to own it. You know, it's not about arrogance, it's just about pride in so many ways. And uh, yeah, knowing where you've come from, I certainly can attest to that. Do you think humans will still be drinking wine in 2,000 years' time? At this stage, I just hope we're still here in 2,000 years' time, so the way the world's going, viruses and wars and uh, all that stuff. Um, yeah, I think so. I think, uh, you know, how many thousands of years back we, we started, we, we drank wine, and we're still doing today. Um, look, as long as there's alcohol, people always definitely be drinking alcohol. And, uh, yeah, as long as climate, everything allows us, um, I believe, yes, we would. Yeah, climate is the, the, the big factor right yeah. now, I'm afraid. Absolutely. So those aliens who landed at Queen Rock were rather impressed with you and the wine you served them, okay. that they want to take you back with them. Okay. <laughs> and they tell you to bring three wines, any three wines, back into space. Mm. What are you going to take? Well... I'm not going to be boring and name up all the, the, the coin rock wines. Okay, so I'll make it a little bit more interesting. Um, I'd love to take one of those Opus ones I mentioned earlier, the 1981. Um, definitely a Risen Freire estate, because that's where I came from in terms of my education. I learned a lot from the guys over there, and uh, still today I have a lot of respect for that. And then, obviously, my coin rock red blend, which is, for me, one of my favorite wines at the moment, and that I know that will last me at least another 20 years. So I will still have something to drink by then. The others I'll drink immediately. So yeah, I hope that that works. And then obviously, if I if I'm allowed a fourth bottle, it'll be a bottle of Olaf Berg brandy as well. Oh. <laughs> well, I did say three bottles of wine, but a bit of brandy thrown in just for 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 good measure is uh, will allow that. Will allow that for sure. Is there a winemaking area anywhere in the world that you still would like to explore? Yeah, for sure. I mean. Um, 
I'll never be satisfied with the, with the amount of places I've traveled. So I was luckily uh, to do a harvest in St. Emilio and I did a harvest in uh, California. And I've been to France, uh, to, the, to the Rhone Valley, to Champagne. I'd still love to, to maybe uh, you know, try my luck over there with a vintage or so. Uh, but I think that something that really intrigues me is the Australian uh, wine market. Uh, not necessarily the wine making and the vineyards or so, but also to understand them a bit better. They seem to gel quite well. They, you know, everything works well in terms of their market and all the government supports and all of that. And I, I, I think you'd know a lot about that as well. And to, to understand how they operate and you know they think big and I've got appreciation for that and um, I see it as one of our biggest competitions so you always want to know what what your competition does so yeah. yeah knowledge is power it certainly helps to know what you're up against that's for sure we're not quite done yet I'd like to play a little game with you okay. so <laughs> I am going to give you three varieties and you need to pair it with a song or an artist yeah okay all right okay <laughs> so I think we're gonna go with Rousson <laughs> Sauvignon Blanc and Petit Vidot yeah okay Rousson Rousson ah, it's a bit of a wild one that's for me more like a Maybe a Bruce Springsteen kind of vibe to it. He's not quite a he's not quite a um, a rebel. It's a known cultivar, um, but there's a certain element to it. It's a bit more natural, and I like Bruce and I like Rosan, so they go well together. The other one's a Sauvignon Blanc, correct? Mm-hmm. Sauvignon Blanc. It's probably Sauvignon Blanc. I would say is mm, probably a bit more feminine. Um, flowery, um, yeah, probably more like a Celine Dion kind of vibe to it. <laughs> Although I don't like the music at all. Sorry, Celine, but yeah. And Petit Vidot. Uh, okay, well, there we've definitely got some structure, um, maybe a bit more heavy metal or um, ACDC kind of vibe really hard at it um, yeah that would be it <laughs> I put it well you definitely did very well um, thank you so much Skog for joining us today would you like to remind our listeners where they can find Queen Rock maybe your URL and what they can expect to find if they ever make their way to Queen Rock Estate yeah sure um, the easiest would be to google uh, Queen Rock um, it's Q-U-O-I-N uh, rock.co.z and on that website you'll find everything about us um, the whole story the whole shebang prices on the wines where to find it and if you can't find anything that you're looking for there you can always drop us an email so happy to hear from them and we hope to see some of um, our listeners actually coming to visit and say hi and say that you've listened to this and then we know you know all, all, of, all of it works um, so yeah that will be the easiest uh, go online and look for a day fantastic thank you so much for your time it was lovely chatting to you today and goodbye to our listeners thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack South Africa for details and updates visit our website winesoundtrack.com